So for, first, I will give you the possibility to react on the last thing, that the lab is not, Mr. Brock is not really convinced of the labs. Um, well, George, work on it a little bit. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then we'll talk. I mean, I, you know, uh, Knight Foundation has been funding something called the Knight News Challenge uh, for more than six years now, and it is international, and we've given away more than 25, I think it's now up to $30 million for um, news innovations around the world. And uh, it's amazing, um, you know, who can come up with the new things. And it, it, because we're talking about digital media here and not brain surgery, anyone, can do it. I mean, people are inventing things in their garages, and if American universities, just speaking for American ones, uh, can't do in a university what someone's doing in a garage, maybe people can save their tuition and go to the guy's garage. Um, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is that it, it can't be easier to try new tools and techniques in, uh, in communication than it is now because the barriers to entry have fallen to near zero. And universities are able to experiment in all their science labs, so they can handle research. And in the United States, $2 billion a year is given from the US government to teaching hospitals to do research. So I think it could, op the lab idea can open up uh, money flows for journalism schools that they don't have now. So, so you think it's just a question of money? Well, it's partly a question of money. I wasn't, let's make clear, I wasn't disagreeing with Eric about labs. What I'm zeroed in on are the particular institutional problems that tend to hit you or trip you in universities when concentrating on that part of the teaching hospital formula or the Newton triad, if you like. I was just trying to point out that there are particular things we have to work on. Money certainly dynamites some of those obstacles out of the way. Anybody who cares to give me any sum of money you care to name to move on my lab project, that'll be fine. Well, well it, it seems that you've been missing out on these uh, global grants. Well, we have people who competed, compete in these competitions, and there are other ones too. Google and IPI did one, for example, a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so we have people who enter them, and we've picked up some funds. But uh, you know, I've got a lot of people. I've got uh, you know nearly 30 people teaching in my teaching in my staff. I want them all to have money. Yeah. What are other obstacles to work on? Well, they're, they're, they're partly psychological. I would call them psychological slash institutional things in universities. Universities are. I don't want to get too technical about this, partly because you may have slightly different system in Dutch universities, but in British universities are completely obsessed by the measurement of research. Not research, the measurement of research. Is that the same here in Holland? Well, um, I like this, uh, um, in, this in, in, in relation to this, um, the, uh, Clayton Christensen, he's the professor at Harvard of the disruptive innovation, and he has a very clear statement on that. He said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you can have clear thoughts about your future, you can think about it very well, and everybody can agree about, yeah, this is what we should do. But then again, there's a culture, a way of doing things, and culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it's the same. I recognize that pattern, yes. Yeah, and, it's, and, 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 and actually, it's very parallel um, in universities to what happens in newspapers. I mean, we're now getting quite big studies. C.W. Anderson just produced one of, I think, about Philadelphia, if uh, uh, Eric will correct me if I'm wrong, in which he studied how a newspaper knew it was going down the tubes. Lots of consultants came in, probably some of them were academics, and said, you need to do this, you need to do that. And then everybody says, sorry, but I've got to get the paper out. And nothing changed. George, I, I want to ask you a question. In, um, you know, big institutions of all types are having trouble you know, being nimble enough to change in the digital age. So in, in, when it comes to actual journalism in the communities, we're seeing in the United States a whole bunch of small nonprofits that are uh, starting up to do a lot of investigative reporting, a lot of community reporting that isn't being done by traditional public broadcast media and traditional newspapers. Yeah. Is there an educational equivalent? In other words, if the, if the university can't change fast enough, how could you come up with that sort of thing, a small independent unit that can do things somehow affiliated with the university? I'm being a little bit 
I'm being a little bit flippant about money, but to be serious about it for a second, if somebody said to my university, you can have 10 million pounds, right. the conditions are nobody works in the university buildings, nobody gives a stuff whether the research is high quality or not, and so on and so on, they'd probably do it because mm -hmm. they like 10 million pounds. There's just a possibility that something really glamorous might emerge from it. So bribery is one way. It's not probably not the only way. I, I, I would In the meantime, are there any questions? Not yet. Okay. I'm curious. I, 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 tried to, I did try to make a point just recently about um, if you want to um, stimulate journalists to become entrepreneurial, to start their own businesses, how important do you gentlemen think it is for them to specialize, to make sure that they have one or two topics of which they know everything about, so they, they can really add value the moment something in the news happens on their topic and, and, and draw their own audiences? Well, I, that's two, I, I'm hearing two different questions. I mean, one is, is, is it important for a journalist to know journalism plus something else? Absolutely. I mean, journalism's become twice as difficult in the digital age. Just being an expert in journalism isn't enough anymore. So that something else doesn't have to be a topic. It can if you're a reporter, but it could be computer science, business, entrepreneurism. And if you're starting a business, your business specialty needs to have something to do with the market. So, you know, it, it, you may decide that you want to be a you know, uh, a um, you know, Spanish-speaking journalist and do a Spanish-speaking uh, publication in your community, but if there aren't any Spanish speakers, it doesn't really <laughs> work. So, so you know, so so for tr in traditional journalism, absolutely, you have to be plus something else. In entrepreneurial efforts, it's got to have some connection to the community. Did you have any specialty back then? Yeah. <laughs> I, my my specialty was uh, knowing math, which a lot of journalists are happy that they're are actually proud that they don't know. I was a computer. I was a math. I was a math uh, kid in high school and started out as a computer scientist until I realized there weren't any attractive women in my classes, and so then I switched to journalism, but for other reasons too. Um, but I, w I came from the math side, so when I ended up, my career, I ended up always uh, being the editor of the paper because I could do the budgets, I could, I, could, I could do all the administrative things that involved math that the other journalists were proud that they didn't have a clue about. So, yeah, having a, knowing something else uh, helped me tremendously. But, 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 that, but that's the skill. The skill you're describing, Eric, is the one that is really needed now rather than specialist knowledge, I would say. I mean, the we don't have a big problem about the demand for news. Mm -hmm. We don't have a big problem about teaching people the professional techniques of conventional journalism. The problem we have mm -hmm. is, make, is finding probably plural business models at all sorts of different levels and sizes and scales mm -hmm. and different markets and cultures. Now, not all journalists are going to do that, but the reason we have an entrepreneurial journalism module that is virtually compulsory for all our master's students is that a larger proportion of them will find themselves in startups or freelance situation, or they will go into a big legacy newsroom and they will be asked to innovate in te open collaborative teams within six months of arriving. 30 years ago, that didn't happen. In a way, you're only saying that specializing is a way of making a business model. Well, I, think it was Ke I think it was Kevin Kelly from Wired, and he said already quite some years ago, he said, if you make sure that you have 1,000 fans on the internet, and a fan is somebody who's willing to spend a one-day salary, $100 per year on your work, if you have 1,000 fans spending $100 per year on your work, you have a business model. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it is, is not everybody ha has, has, that, has that good thing, but the... I, I really do agree with Richard Gingras, I think it is, the head of news at Google, who said, you know, the time has gone when people can affect ignorance of the other side of the business. Watch out that you're not falling over. Um, how about your student? Yeah. yeah. I just flipped through it. I think you should. Everybody <laughs> likes the title. This entrepreneurial Listen to this man carefully. He's very wise. But, but, but tell us a little bit about your students. How many of them? 300, you said? Well, I've got, I've got over 300 master students, uh, to which I add about uh, 270 undergraduates doing a BA journalism. It's a huge school.
And are they all prepared to being a specialist? Well, um, the master's students don't get any choice about whether they have to do this module called entrepreneurial journalism. We have another module which we call specialism, uh, where they can pick from a range of about 10. So yes, there is specialist journalism training in there, in the master's training, slightly less than the undergraduate. So in that sense, there are no old-fashioned journalists around anymore at your university? Gen you mean general assignment journalists? Um, well, some of them will be, I think, probably at the starts of their careers. If they join big newsrooms, they become news producers at Sky or whatever, they will be general assignment to start with. You have every possible... Ver I mean, we have such a number of students, and therefore there are multiple outcomes, and we have a pretty big media system in Britain. Almost anything happens. Any questions coming up? We have a few more minutes. Over there, yes. Hello, what's your name? Hi, my name is Gerard Smith, and I'm, I'm a member of the journalism lab in uh, Utrecht. So, <laughs> we already started to use his name, although I don't think we are doing the things that you suppose we are uh, to be doing. But my question is, um, how come that this idea, this whole idea of the um, teaching hospital is, seems so evident, seems so logical at this moment. Um, why? Um, is it something universal that we just didn't thought about uh, five years ago? Or is it something that is really something of this, uh, of this period we are living in and is coming from economical reasons? Could you please use that microphone over there? Well, I think necessity is the mother of invention. So um, a lot of things in journalism 10 or 20 years ago in the United States just weren't possible. Student journalism would not be allowed on the front page of the Boston Globe 10 years ago, certainly not 20 years ago. Um, there weren't almost 20,000 unemployed journalists who had vanished out of the local journalism scene uh, because of uh, cutbacks in the last 10 years that hadn't happened 10 years ago. Uh, there hadn't been a digital age that 20 years ago uh, that allowed every single person to get involved in news and information. Um, and the, the billions of dollars in Silicon Valley or Silicon Roundabout <laughs> Uh, uh, investment hadn't produced hundreds and thousands of new companies that were competitors to journalism. The stock price of an American newspaper company had not, had not fallen 90% uh, as it did in 2008, 2009. So I, these things all created a sense of, on the one hand, desperation, and on the other hand, possibility that made people look again at everything we were doing. And I think that it's, journalism education was, has been insulated uh, because the economic model is we take the money from the students and we spend it on the, on the professors. And that economic model is still functioning. It's not a market, uh, the same kind of market model. So journalism's been turned upside down and inside out by the digital age. Journalism education's been insulated. But now the digital age is knocking on the door of education with um, massively, you know, massive online open classes with distance learning. You know, uh, people can now go on the internet and learn to play the guitar, go on the internet and learn to code, go on the internet and learn whatever they want to learn. So I think that all of this combined is causing a re-examination of, you know, frankly, 20, 30 years ago, traditional journalists were just too arrogant to consider, and educators were con just too arrogant to consider that anything they were doing was, wasn't just the best. So it's a different world now. One last question here. Uh, I'm Pete Bakker. I'm, from, I'm a colleague of Gerard from the same lab in Utrecht. Um, uh, Eric just said uh, or painted a very gloomy picture, people getting out, uh, losing their jobs, uh, newspapers, seeing their stock prices dropped, 
And George said, uh, well, the golden age of journalism, as it was in his book, uh, as it is in his book, um, only lasted 30 years or something like that. Bef before that and after that, we, we, we've been in a tight spot already. So the picture you paint is that if we change journalism education, we will change journalism and everything will be all right again. I have a slightly different approach. Aren't we heading to a situation where we have a smaller journalism, actually? So we, we don't do the big media, the big corporations. Uh, how many entrepreneurs will we need? And we have these uh, classes in our school where people uh, develop their own news media sort of lab situation, and every comes up, everybody comes up with a new app. How many news apps can we have in the world? Uh, can, can we go for an economy of shrink, uh, that we ac actually acknowledge the fact that schools will be smaller, that there's a, a smaller portion of journalists, not less important, but smaller in size, uh, at least? I don't think that it is necessarily an absolute catastrophe if the absolute size of journalism measured by the number of people calling themselves journalists gets smaller. The classic industrial age in the last 20th century was historically exceptional in every possible way, and that was the largest population of journalists. We are, after all, adapting, are we not, to an information-saturated world. One of the things that journalism has to do is to say, what in an information-saturated world is actually journalism? A world in which anybody can call themselves a journalist, what is the distinctive function of journalism? Now, I won't do my lecture on this subject right now, but uh, it, because the whole nature of the journalism function has changed, th there should be no surprise if the population of people who would define themselves as professional journalists will change. I think it probably, for a time, will get smaller. But to answer your question about the people doing the apps and the entrepreneurs and so on, don't forget that the big institutions of today were single-person entrepreneurs some time ago. It's a process. It takes a long time for the acorns to grow into oak trees. Well, the, the long time can now be five years, the average length of life cycle of a company. But these companies will employ thousands of people, so uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. So the, the, but I think, I, you know, the, <laughs> most of the golden age of journalism wasn't about journalism, it was about the gold. And that, you know, the investigative journalism that was paid for on the backs of the excess profits that the companies were making. Um, but there were a lot of, there was a lot about how journalism was, certainly in the United States, uh, 20, 30 years ago, that was not good not community connected, not reflective of the population of the country, too isolated, too arrogant, too self-absorbed. And so we have a chance now to try again and do a better job with the new technologies. Um, you know, they, there's, there are an awful lot of jobs now that are journalistic, but wouldn't be filled by someone calling themselves a journalist when Every company has to have a website when some of those companies are in the nonfiction business. They need nonfiction communicators who act journalistically. Companies like people, nonprofits like Human Rights Watch or Witness uh, do things that have a higher information ethic than the average journalism because of the human rights stuff they deal with. So, you know, eventually all companies will explain their, uh, or all, the, all, uh, all ethical companies will explain their information processes openly and transparently online, and we'll be able to become more aware of all of those jobs those, uh, that are being occupied by the journalism and communication majors. Even though the traditional news jobs in the United States is down, the hiring of the graduates is not down. So those graduates are now going into jobs that the universities don't really understand and can't really describe. Because we are in a day where everyone is trying to communicate. And a lot of that communication, not enough of it, but a lot of it, is, is non-fiction communication. So. I was going <laughs> to round it up, but George Brock wants to say one more thing, not about your book. 
No, cer certainly not. I wanted to reassure you about the kids making apps and your worry about, you know, how many apps can we stand. The uh, journalism enterprise that is hiring people faster in London at the moment, it started in New York, is BuzzFeed.com. BuzzFeed hires, hires as many coders as it hires reporters because it has this fantastically good back end. If your kids have done apps, their chances of getting hired by people like BuzzFeed are twice as good. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you so much for this part. We'll be having a short break, 15 minutes, then we'll be getting back with two panels and we would like to discuss further with you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.